I'm going to start with some data from our annual flagship study on the topic, which is the Infinite Dial. The Infinite Dial is the longest running study of consumer habits, technology, media in the United States. Uh, it's been going since 1998, and I've worked on it since 2004. I was, I was just a boy then. But it is certainly the longest running longitudinal study of many aspects of digital media consumption, audio being uh, the preeminent one. And really, to start with, I'm going to look at three major trends, the trend towards online audio in general, uh, a little bit on smart speakers, and a little bit on podcasting. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap up with how all of those things kind of mesh together, if you will. So we'll start with a little bit on online audio. First of all, the Infinite Dial is a nationally representative projectable study of Americans 12 plus. Uh, we use uh, telephone sampling, which is still the gold standard in survey research. Over half of our sample is mobile phone only. So we spend uh, appropriate time and treasure to do this right so that we're able to project it. And for some of the things that we project, as you can see uh, from online audio listening, we've actually been presenting this research for many, many years. In fact, uh, this graph, we started tracking online audio listening monthly way back in 2000. So there's over 20 years of data here. Uh, and currently in the United States, online audio of any kind reaches 68% of the country 12 plus. That's about 193 million Americans. And that ain't nothing. Uh, it's plateaued a little bit. Uh, as you can see, I think we may continue to see that bump up a little bit more as it becomes more and more integrated into the car. The car remains really uh, the, the kind of last great empire for digital audio, as it were. Uh, the reach of AM, FM radio in this country is in the high 80s, to give you some perspective on that. And internet access, in fact, in this country is uh, between 88 and 90 percent. So just to put those numbers into perspective a little bit. But currently, 68% of Americans have listened to some kind of online audio in the last month. And if you look at that in the last week, that's 62%. So there's a pretty high conversion there from monthly to weekly. It's really become a habit for most Americans, uh, a weekly habit, and in fact, a daily habit, which I will get to. And one of the uh, crazy things about this stat, uh, I love stats where both the numerator and the denominator grow. Uh, and in this case, certainly the denominator, which is the number of people who listen to online audio, has grown pretty steadily since uh, 2000 when we started tracking it. But also the number of hours that they spend listening to that audio, even in the face of the growth in bodies, has also grown, which if you, if you know numbers, is not an easy thing. You would certainly expect uh, as you start to get into those late adopters, they would potentially be more casual consumers of audio and maybe bring those averages down. Um, but if you listen to online audio in a typical week, you listen to about 16 and a quarter hours of that. Uh, and that can be through a variety of sources. That can be certainly through your mobile phone. That can be through your desktop, through a dedicated appliance for that sort of thing. Uh, but online audio is absolutely a part of the everyday lives of uh, the majority of Americans at this point. I'll touch a little bit on brands, uh, the top brands in kind of the streaming audio space, if not, uh, certainly not yet the podcasting space, which we'll get to. But in the streaming audio space, uh, Spotify is number one in terms of monthly listening. 29% of Americans 12 plus have listened to Spotify in the last month. And you'll see that's followed by Pandora, Google Play, uh, which is now YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Apple, iHeart, and SoundCloud. Uh, but the audio space from a brand perspective has grown in some different ways. You have Spotify, which has certainly grown their brand as an all-inclusive, uh, completely vertically integrated brand where all of their offerings are under the Spotify umbrella. You also have companies like Liberty Media. Liberty Media uh, owns Sirius XM. Uh, they own Pandora. They own Stitcher Midroll, a big podcasting company. Uh, and they have uh, sales agreements with SoundCloud. So they sort of have not been completely vertically integrated, but are spread out across a number of, uh, of other brands. And of course, uh, Apple remains a significant player. Google and Amazon are significant players as well. Uh, and that's monthly listening. In weekly listening, you see Spotify really here is clear number one. A quarter of Americans have listened to Spotify in the last week. And that's really been a, a fairly recent trend. They've been kind of neck and neck with Pandora for many years. The past couple of years, you've seen Spotify grow there. Uh, and they've certainly grown their presence in spoken word audio, 
Uh, and if there's really a big story in audio over the last five years, it's been the growth of spoken word audio. There's been a, a real renaissance uh, or a renaissance, perhaps, as the French might say, uh, of spoken word audio in the last five years. Um, when we started doing another uh, particular piece of research that we do, which I'll touch on in a moment, uh, it's a study called Share of Ear. Uh, the percentage of audio listening in, in total that was allocated to music is about 82%, and spoken word audio of any kind was about 18%. Uh, and now that's 76% and 24%. And that's a big change in just five years' time. Uh, that's not a number that you would expect to change necessarily at all. And one of the biggest reasons for that change uh, has been the growth in podcasting, which has really provided uh, new roots, in a way, for spoken word audio. Uh, not completely new, given that radio used to be predominantly that at one time. And there used to be stronger talk radio and stronger spoken word uh, broadcast radio, perhaps, than there is today. Uh, but spoken word has certainly taken root and is a vehicle, I think, for marketers, not only to advertising, but to produce their own uh, branded material and to really become content creators and producers of their own right in, in the podcasting space. We'll get to podcasting in a little bit. A lot of time is spent on the percentage of people who listen to audio, and we often think of things like digital audio as being in between the earbuds, but that's not necessarily always the case. And in fact, you can see here the frequency of listening to audio with other people, about a quarter say they frequently do that, and 27% say that they sometimes do that. Uh, and we recently did a study, in fact, for, uh, we did a study for Pandora, where we asked people to kind of keep a diary of their daily listening. And at least for Pandora, we learned that uh, for every stream that Pandora was putting out there into the internet, uh, it was 1.4 people listening to it. So there's a lot of co-listening that happens in digital media. It's not just between those little white earbuds. So it's not purely uh, an intimate experience. It can, in fact, be a group or co-listening experience. We see that especially on the young end uh, for this particular question, 12 to 34, about a third of 12 to 34 year olds say they frequently listen to audio with other people. Uh, and that does go down a little bit uh, as you get to 55 plus. So the next kind of major trend I wanna to touch upon here are smart speakers. And you know, as I mentioned, the infinite dial has been running continuously since 1998 and I've worked on it for uh, what, 17 or 18 years now. And we've tracked a lot of technologies, a lot of different kinds of media platforms Smart speakers and smart audio are the fastest growing technology that we've tracked. In fact, they've grown more rapidly in the early years than things like smartphones uh, or internet connected TVs and even some media like podcasting. When we first started tracking smart speakers and smart audio, and by this I'm referring to things like the Amazon Alexa suite of products and uh, Google, uh, Google Assistant driven products and, and things like that. 7% uh, of Americans back in 2017 had one of these, at least one of these devices in their home. Today, that's a third of Americans 12 plus or 94 million Americans have at least one of these devices in their home. And from 2017 to 2019, uh, they essentially tripled. And one of the things I think that helped smart speakers along in that respect uh, is that they got pretty cheap pretty quickly, unlike a lot of other kind of consumer media from the get go. They didn't take years and years and years to come down in price. Uh, they started at maybe a couple hundred dollars, but it didn't take long for both uh, Google and Amazon to have $30 versions, even at the checkout line of Whole Foods. Uh, so these devices became a lot more ubiquitous. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were really kind of the holiday gift, uh, it's not du jour, I guess, donné uh, for a lot of people. And they, they continue to sort of pile up in people's homes and what we've learned in a variety of studies about smart speakers and smart audio, in fact, we've done an annual study in partnership with NPR called the Smart Audio Report. It's been out also since 2017, is that these devices don't sit at the back of junk drawers. Uh, people use them, people use them repeatedly. And the average person who owns a smart speaker does around eight different things with it on a regular basis. So uh, the number one use case for them is of course, listening to audio, but many of us use them for uh, laundry timers, kitchen timers, the weather, uh, and even uh, allergy cast, which is my favorite skill. And you can probably hear it in my voice. Uh, it is one of those days. 
Uh, the pandemic has also had a bit of an impact on smart speaker listening, not necessarily in smart speaker ownership, although uh, you, you might wrongly infer that from this particular graph. I, I will point out here that uh, this does not show a causal relationship, but merely an association. If you work at home, you are much more likely to own one of these devices. The U.S. population 12 plus is at a third for owning a smart speaker. Uh, if you're someone who is employed full or part time and you work from home, and again, this was taken during the pandemic, so many of us are working from home, 49% uh, of you own a smart speaker. Does not imply that people who work from home went out and bought a smart speaker or that working from home encouraged the purchase of a smart speaker. Uh, it's merely that the people who work from home, like myself and, and perhaps many of you, uh, work in information-driven jobs, have disposable income, uh, and are economically perhaps more able to buy one or more of these devices. So that's really what that, uh, what that implies. However, what we do know is that during the pandemic, people who own these devices have used them more because they are, in fact, home a lot more, and they've used these devices uh, to consume audio in a variety of settings that perhaps they hadn't thought of before. And you may not have had these devices in your workplace, but when you're working from home, it's very easy to ask one of these devices to play audio. And if you are interested, uh, please do look up the Smart Audio Report from Edison Research and NPR. You can go very deep on smart speakers. Uh, another major use case that we've seen in the past couple of years is the use of these devices in homes with children, uh, children under the age of 18. Uh, and these devices have been both used by the children, uh, by the parents to entertain the children, uh, and in some cases to actually even raise the children, I think, N not in mind. Um, as I mentioned at the very start when we talked about online audio, found it incredible that both the numerator and the denominator for online audio grew. Uh, in other words, the percentage of people who consume online audio, but also the amount of time the average consumer consumes, both of those things went up. Same kind of phenomenon is true with, with smart speakers. Not only does the percentage of Americans who own a smart speaker continue to rise, but the number of devices in the homes of those individuals also continues to rise. Uh, last year in the Infinite Dial, if you owned a smart speaker, if you indicated that you owned one of these devices, uh, chances are you own more than one. In fact, the average was 2.2. This year, that average is 2.3. And you can see over a third say they have three or more devices. And I have talked to many people, many people uh, in this space that own uh, even more than that. I've talked to people that have seven of these in their home. I've talked to people that own uh, 11 of these in their home. And what these devices do and why they're important to this particular conversation is that they allow audio to be consumed in multiple rooms of the house. We know for a fact that, uh, and because again, we learned this from the infinite dial, uh, 18 to 34 year olds in the United States, half of them say they don't even have a radio in their home anymore. Uh, but if you have a smart speaker, you in fact do have a radio and a podcast device and a client for Pandora and Spotify and audiobooks and any number of other digital audio sources. And all of those things are incredibly important for marketers because audio, besides the reach implications, uh, and the, there's also the engagement implications. And I think podcasting especially is a marvelous engagement tool for marketers. Uh, if you've already got people in at the top of the funnel, uh, to when you kind of aggregate the people who are really interested and engaged with your brand, uh, it gives them a, a marvelous way to interact with your brand at a deeper level. And that, of course, brings me to podcasting. We've been tracking podcasting since the very beginning of time of podcasting. Uh, Podcasting as we know it was essentially invented uh, in the early 2000s. We've been tracking it since 2005 uh, and really reporting it since 2006. Uh, and today, in terms of people who are familiar with the term, 78% of Americans 12 plus say they are at least familiar with the term podcasting. That doesn't mean they necessarily know exactly what it is. Uh, at the very fringes of this figure, there remains some confusion. Uh, one aspect of that, that uh, people who are familiar with the term, but don't yet listen to podcasts, some of them will say, it's not for me, I haven't found one for me. And that, of course, is likely not true. There's really a podcast for everybody. Some other people will say that uh, it costs money to subscribe to a podcast because we generally have to pay for things that we subscribe to, like uh, Netflix and uh, Time Magazine and the Fruit of the Month Club. 
So there's a little bit of confusion there. Uh, but as a common mainstream term in everyday American parlance, uh, it's up there. 222 million Americans have heard of the term. In terms of those who have ever listened, well, we passed the majority a couple of years ago. And today, 57% of Americans 12 plus say they've ever listened to a podcast. That's 162 million people. Uh, it's grown linearly and steadily really every year. It's not shown that kind of rocket ship growth that YouTube and online video showed earlier on. But it's it's kind of been the, the little engine that could, and now it's the significant engine that could, as every year those figures go up. Uh, and really in the last four years, you start to really see some significant growth there. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Certainly money is a big reason. As money has poured into the space, investment money, advertising money, uh, the production values and the content have gotten better and better. The mainstream, the availability of more mainstream content has increased a lot in the last four years. When podcasting first started back in the mid 2000s, it was two white guys talking about internet routers uh, in a lot of cases. But today, of course, you know, we have things like true crime, one of the uh, largest genres in podcasting, politics, current events, celebrity gossip. There really is a podcast for everybody, and that's reflected in these numbers. In terms of monthly listening, more than four in 10 Americans, 12 plus now, say that they uh, listen to podcasts uh, at least once a month. That's 116 million Americans. And I, as I mentioned before, when podcasting really first got started, it kind of was two white dudes talking about routers. That's changed a lot, especially, again, in the last uh, five years. You can see in terms of uh, the gender balance, today, 43% of men and 39% of women say that they've listened to a podcast in the last month. So uh, that's getting more and more equal. Uh, podcasting back in 2006, the audience was two-thirds male. So uh, little by little, over time, the audience has gotten more imbalance in gender. It's gotten more imbalance in race, and it's gotten more imbalance in age. Uh, and in terms of the recent growth, at least demographically, you'll see there's really been growth at the uh, youngest end and at the older end. It's happened really at the older end, I think, organically. Uh, a lot of the people now who are aging into that 55 uh, plus category might have been podcast listeners for uh, for several years, because for a long time, it was actually 35 to 54 that was the strongest category. But I think today, as that group ages into 55 plus, and also you see significant growth on the young end, uh, and that's really been, I think, besides uh, more mainstream content, the second big driver of increased podcast consumption in the past couple of years is the adoption of podcasting by some of the largest streaming platforms. And I'll, I'll single out Spotify here uh, simply because Spotify is so huge on the young end as having a, a major role in bringing more people on that 12 to 34 end into podcasting. Um, I mentioned that the gender balance of podcasting has gotten better and better. Uh, here you can see it compared to the U.S. population. The U.S. population is 48% male, 49% female, 2% non-binary. Uh, and that's really, really close to where podcasting is today. Uh, so we've seen that, again, year over year, uh, kind of tick slowly and surely towards what the balance of the U.S. population looks like. So there truly is a podcast for everybody. I mentioned also that diversity in the podcast audience has gotten better and better. Uh, and I'll show you here data from 2011, 2016, and 2021. Uh, back in 2011, the podcast audience was 68% white. Uh, today, it's 57% white. So it's, it's fairly diverse, um, even a little bit more diverse than the U.S. population in general. Uh, and again, that's really come down to having more content, more diverse content, and more diverse voices in the podcasting space, which makes it an important channel for marketers across the board. Uh, I showed you earlier that monthly podcast consumption was at 41%. Weekly podcast consumption is now at 28%. That's about 80 million Americans. Uh, and that's up a, a pretty good clip from last year when it was at 24%. Uh, and the last couple of stats I'll show you in podcasting are really with that weekly podcast audience. And we ask a couple of questions here. How many shows do you listen to a week and how many episodes? Because those are kind of two different things, right? If you listen to The Daily, for instance, from New York Times or Up First from NPR, that's one show. But if you listen to it every day, that's five or six episodes a week. So the average weekly podcast listener listens to over five different shows a week now. 
uh, and that works out to eight episodes per week. But as you can see on this pie chart, 20% uh, about, say, 11 or more episodes and 19%, uh, say, six to 10 episodes. So there's tremendous amount of podcast consumption that happens. And in fact, if you are someone who regularly listens to podcasts, podcast content is your number one audio source of content, more than AM, FM radio. Uh, that may seem like an obvious conclusion to you, but that was not true even as recently as three or four years ago. Uh, and we know this from another study that we put out. This is a quarterly study. Uh, we don't make this as public. So the data that I'm going to show you here is special for you, Digimarcon people who have let me into your homes, uh, where I will do no damage, hopefully. Uh, and that's a quarterly study we do called Share of Ear. This is a significant quarterly study with a 4,000 person uh, per quarter sample. People in the sample are asked to keep a daily diary of all of the audio that they listen to in kind of 15 minute increments on their sample day. They tell us what type of audio it was, where they were when they listened to it, uh, what kind of device was used, what kind of content it was, even in some cases, the brand. Uh, and we basically churn through all of that data to come up with a stat that we call share of ear. And the data that I'm about to show you here, you're going to see some percentages. And those percentages are not percentages of humans as the infinite dial graphs that I have shown you lately. They are percentages of the amount of time that we spend overall listening to audio. Americans listen to about four hours of, four hours of audio every single day. Uh, and in back in 2014, this is back in 2014 now, so we're looking at nearly seven years ago, just over half of all of the audio that we listen to was AM FM radio content, whether that's AM FM on a radio or AM FM content that has been simulcast online. Uh, practically speaking, that's actually a very small part of AM FM content. The simulcast streams of AM FM radio uh, are not a huge part of AM FM listening. Streaming audio was 11% of our audio time back in 2014. And by that, I mean the pure play streaming audio companies like Pandora, Spotify, uh, even things like Google and Amazon are all in that 11%. 18% of the audio we listened to back then was our owned music, whether that's uh, digital music files, vinyl, cassettes, if you rock them, all of that was 18%. YouTube as an audio source was 5%. Uh, Sirius XM satellite radio, about 7% of our audio. Uh, TV music channels, and I don't mean MTV by this because they don't really play music anymore. Uh, but by this, I mean those kind of cable uh, music choice channels that might be at the end of your cable or satellite package, truly music only, uh, but a significant percentage of our listening time is actually spent listening to those. People enjoy putting those on in the background. And then you'll see podcasts at 2%. And again, that's not humans, it's 2% of listening. Uh, and that may seem like a small number. If it prints on this graph, it is not a small number. If it prints on this graph, it's still at least tens of millions of hours of audio every single day. And of course, there are lots of zeros averaged into that number for all the people who don't listen at all to podcasts. So that was back in 2014. Here's how it looks today. And there are some significant differences here in 2021. Uh, AM, FM radio, still the plurality of what we listen to, but no longer the majority. It's gone from 51% to 39% of all of our audio time. Streaming audio has gone up from 11% to 18%, really flipping places here with owned music, which has gone down from 18 to 11 as we've become more comfortable uh, renting music, as it were, or listening to music that we don't own uh, with ser services, again, like Spotify and Pandora. And the other things that I'll point out here, uh, YouTube for audio only has grown as double from 5% to 10%. Satellite continues to grow a little bits every year. It's a major force in this country. And podcasts have tripled. Nothing's grown more than podcasts. Back in 2014, there were 2% of our share of year, actually about 1.7. Today, that number is 6%. Uh, that is significant. And to put that in perspective, the advertisers will understand. Back in 2014, with podcasting at 2% and with AM, FM at 51, that's a 1 to 25 ratio in terms of all of our listening. Today, 6% to 39%, that's more like a 1 to 7 ratio. So if, uh, if you're doing any kind of investment in audio, uh, keep that in mind. Podcasting is now a seventh 
of all of broadcast radio. And broadcast radio in this country is still a $15 billion business. And as you can see, the plurality there listening. So it has not gone anywhere. Uh, the last couple of things I'll point out here before I pause and take some questions. Uh, the pandemic has certainly had an impact on our listening. Uh, it hasn't changed our behavior in location. So in other words, it hasn't changed our behavior in the car, and it hasn't changed our behavior at home. But we listen differently in the car, and we listen differently at home. In the car, AM, FM radio is still the dominant force. It's the default install for millions of people. It's also the choice for millions of people. So in the car, AM, FM radio continues to lead and share of year. Uh, but at home, digital sources are number one, as you might expect. Uh, those two aspects of how we listen to audio have not changed during the pandemic, but what has changed is that we are home an awful lot more. Uh, and because we are home an awful lot more, that has actually led to digital audio during the pandemic eclipsing uh, terrestrial broadcast radio. And the devices that we listen to audio on, uh, now for the first time, over 50% of our listening uh, is now on some kind of a digital device. Before the COVID-19 disruptions in our share of your data, 55% of our audio listening was on a non-digital device, and 45% was on something like a smartphone. Uh, today, that's essentially flipped. And again, that's really a result of us being at home a lot more. And when we are at home, as I mentioned, uh, that's when you start to see digital audio sources really come to the fore. Streaming audio grows to 21% of our listening, YouTube grows to 15% of our audio listening. Uh, satellite goes down, AM, FM radio goes down, uh, and podcasts are even greater at 7% of our listening. So what's really changed in the past year, essentially, is the amount of time that we're at home. How we listen at home has not changed a great deal, uh, but that makes listening on digital devices even more prominent in our share of your research. Um, so that's a sort of a, a quick kind of a tour to audio uh, of of how Americans are listening. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap things up a little bit here by just pointing out a number of things about audio. Audio is kind of unique in that it is both a lean forward and a lean back medium. And there are opportunities there for marketers in both camps. You know, in terms of being a lean back medium, there's certainly opportunity there uh, for sponsorships, advertising, for people who are passively consuming audio. And many of the Digital streaming media platforms are great places to put that kind of messaging. Uh, but it's even more powerful, I think, as a lean forward medium. Audio can be a companion medium to other things you're doing. You can listen to audio while you're doing many other things, including shop online. But it is lean forward audio that has provided an enormous amount of engagement for marketers. And I think the things to explore here are legion. Uh, certainly, there is advertising in popular podcasts or in podcasts that super serve the niche or niche, as the French might say, that your brand is, uh, is going after. You also have the opportunity to produce branded podcasts. And there are some marvelous branded podcasts out there. Uh, look up things like the Slack Variety Stack. That's a wonderful branded podcast uh, that aren't simply about the product. In fact, a podcast that is about the product or service that is bringing you that podcast is not a very good podcast. Uh, so if you're going to think about getting into the branded podcast space, I would encourage you to do it right. I would encourage you to find a host who is actually entertaining and engaging. I would encourage you not to make it about your product or service, but about making the lives of your customers and prospects a little bit easier, removing some friction from their lives, serving some other need. Uh, and they will be grateful for that. And there's loads of data to back this up, both from Edison uh, and also from the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau has a lot of data on pure sponsorship of audio uh, and pure sponsorship on the web in general. So I would encourage you to pursue that. Uh, we're starting to see some sort of new kinds of deals now. Uh, just this week, uh, a very popular sports podcaster, sports personality named Dan Levitard, used to be with ESPN, uh, left ESPN, started his own podcast company. And uh, the rights to all of that have just been purchased by a non-media company. They've been purchased by DraftKings, which is a, a fantasy sports and sports betting service. That is a brand, not a media company, but a brand that has purchased the rights to a media company so that they can uh, be the sole sponsor, sole advertiser, and really bring you that content. Um, so there's all kinds of ways to get into the space as a marketer besides just advertising, uh, but 
principally among them. It's a marvelous way to engage more deeply with your customers, to engage more deeply with your prospects than the other channels that you do. Uh, and I'm pleased to have been involved in this space for as long as I have and will continue to do so uh, with Edison for, for years to come. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions, uh, see if there's any uh, comments or any any other data that I can explain. Uh, trying to get you back on time here, Kenneth. Oh, you did great. Can you hear me and see me okay? I sure can. Uh, I love it when you bring up my favorite podcast as well as yours, This Old Router. This Old Router yeah. uh, introduced me to the medium, uh, and you know I still listen to it fondly. But you buy your smart speakers at Whole Foods. I think that's fantastic. Where you can get, you know, devout your whole check and then they retarget you forever and ever. So I got a couple of questions. What are your thoughts on the monetization really being discussed uh, a lot this week with Apple, with podcasts, where that may take the market because they're still such a player for where people consume podcasts? Yeah, I, I mean, I. I have some concerns uh, about that. I think, first of all, the ability to make money from subscription podcasts, which both Apple and Spotify mm -hmm. are now enabling for people, it's it's good news for creators. I mean, the, the one thing I would caution a creator about is uh, it's really difficult, really difficult to both build audience and monetize audience at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you need to spend an awful lot of money to do that. And even when you do spend an awful lot of money, it's not guaranteed. There was a subscription podcast startup a couple of years ago called Luminary that spent mm -hmm. a crap ton of money uh, trying to build audience from scratch uh, to subscribe to to um, you know to, to the content that's behind their paywall. I don't think they were particularly successful, uh, and even today they're now essentially hitching their wagon to Apple's uh, subscription channels uh, as a way to continue to try to monetize that. So it's hard to build and monetize at the same time. Um, so, but it's good news for creators, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good news for the space in that it's just another revenue model. And I, my belief in all of these things in terms of revenue models, you have direct support through things like Patreon, you have subscription models, uh, you have advertising models, you have branded content, and more is more gooder uh, is I think the smartest thing I can say as a marketer. Uh, the more different and robust revenue streams that uh, podcast creators have, I think, the more stable the medium is and the more it's going to continue to eat away uh, at the total advertising spend, which again, the majority of the audio advertising spend continues to go to AMFM radio. Yeah, and that's such a great point, especially as I think about my own podcast, I worked on building my own audience uh, up to about 280 episodes and I just launched with two sponsors uh, last week. So I'm pretty excited, but I spent the time cultivating that audience before I just started hitting everybody with ads that were really going to annoy them. So that was really important to me. Uh, it, and obviously Apple needed yet more revenue streams. They, they just couldn't quite, quite be happy enough. But one of the ones I really want to talk to you about, because I've heard you and seen you, I've seen you talking or heard you talking about this is Clubhouse. Uh, there's a couple of folks that we know commonly. I think um, you could probably build on the, on the graph one or 2% for Brian Fanzo's time alone on Clubhouse. Uh, a lot of the folks that I see all the time, Joseph Jaffe, Mitch Joel, these people that we know, Clubhouse has, you know, for the, for the Apple folks of the world, is really taking up a lot of times. I find myself consuming mm -hmm. hours on end, but listening to it more on AM radio than necessarily running a room. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about where we're going in with drop-in audio. Yeah, so one of the things that I think... Um... Clubhouse is highlighting is how hard it is to do good audio. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I say this with, with love in my heart. There's not much great on Clubhouse at any given moment. Uh, if you were to log in right now, yeah. there's probably not something great on Clubhouse. Uh, you may have listened to a great uh, Clubhouse room at one point. You may look forward to a, a one on Saturday. You may look forward to one that's scheduled at a given time. You may follow certain moderators. Um, it, it doesn't really have, it has an interestingness problem. I think if I log into Facebook or Twitter or Instagram right now, and I have five minutes, I will be interested and intrigued and find something in those five minutes. Um, and it's really hard to do great live audio. Uh, I, I think that's why, you know, I mentioned the news about Dan Lebitzar getting 50 million from DraftKings because his team is really good at a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Really good. 
and it's really hard to do. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of the way most people, the vast majority of people are going to consume Clubhouse is going to be as an audience member. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, there are a lot of bad podcasts out there. Try doing them now live with random guests. Um, so that said, I think, you know, there, there could be a place for the right brand uh, that's not trying to build reach. Um, but you need, to, you need to have the talent to do it. Uh, it's not yeah. a place, I think, to kind of stumble around because uh, it's just so difficult to do. Well, I was redesigning my own website. And so most of the time I would just listen to it in the background. And one of the things I was thinking about really in, in, when I saw you or heard you speak in a room was there is the different level of engagement that almost has to be measured. It's the how much time are we consuming talking on social media, like when we create a tweet or a Facebook post versus how much time I'm just listening to it in the background, like as if I turn on AM radio. And that's going to be hard to really break apart, uh, you know, future set. So if anybody else has any questions, please drop them in as quickly as you can there on the left. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention, do you see either of these plateauing uh, or anytime soon? And I, I've thought about Clubhouse in particular and with the drop off we saw in podcasts as the world opens back up. There's obviously going to be a shift to, and I noticed it with my, with a speaking event I did about a month ago in Florida. The last thing I was thinking about, despite the fact that I'd been listening to uh, radio and podcasts and streaming services, the last thing I took when I got back out on the road again was a streaming service like Clubhouse. I wanted to download a podcast, get on the plane, set it and forget it and kind of zone out. I'm wondering if, as we open the world back, up more uh, in the, you know, for a lot of our Canadian friends, it'll be a little bit later. But as we open that back up, do you think there'll be a shift back into more podcast and less on some of these other streaming services? You know, anytime, um, and I've been a media researcher for 25 years, Kenneth, anytime there's some kind of what I would call a discontinuous event, um, which the pandemic was certainly one, you know, what happens is the, the snow globe of our habits gets shaken up. And everything eventually resettles, but it doesn't settle exactly where it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, nothing is going to go back exactly the way that it was. You know, we've spent a lot of time at home and a lot of our at home habits are going to be difficult to shake. You know, I think just as maybe you and I are eager to get back on planes and speak in front of uh, conferences on stages again, there are a lot of other people who've been working at home for the past year that are not so eager to go back to the office. Right. Mm -hmm. Um that's that's simply true. We've done a lot, a lot of research on that. So not every habit is going to go back the way it was. Uh, I think Clubhouse has enjoyed some leeway. I don't think that, uh, you know, when, quote unquote, things go back to the way they were, which, again, they never will. I don't think that means people stop using it, uh, because, first of all, 90 percent of Americans have never heard of it. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. That's not a guess. Um, mm -hmm. So the story is yet to be written there. Uh, but what what we have had during the pandemic is is I think Clubhouse has gotten a little bit more leeway. Um, I've I've had more patience to wait for something good, or more I've checked into it more often to find that good thing. And when you find that good thing, it's really it's fun, right? I mean, Clubhouse mm -hmm. rooms are fun, especially if you're a speaker uh, or, or oh, a yeah. moderator. But the one thing I would say about that is that there is an absolute hard cap on the percentage of Americans who want to speak out in front of people they don't know, right? Uh, and you see that hard cap with Twitter, which has really slowed down over the last five years. Uh, there's just a hard cap on that about the percentage of people who want to get on stage of any kind in front of people they don't know and have conversations. Uh, but Clubhouse does enable something that's kind of unique, though, and that is, I think, passive lean back listening, which podcasting is not necessarily great for. It's hard to to passively listen to a podcast, right? And do something else, you really lose your place. But Clubhouse is the kind of thing that you can dip into and consume passively. So, you know, going quote unquote back to work may not impact it as much as we think. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the three things. It was two for the longest time until I got into Clubhouse, but between Netflix, TikTok and Clubhouse, they filled the at-home void for me more yeah. so than they than they had before, but who knows how that'll rebound. So Tom, again, honored and thank you. Uh, look forward to seeing you back out on the road at some point and uh, God bless you. Have a great day. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation.